Um, I, you know, obstacles. I think we actually are the obstacles. Uh, the adults are the obstacles. Um, and it plays itself out in so many different ways. Uh, it plays itself out in the structures that we set up. Um, as, and, and, and I say that um, not to say that um, there, people don't have good intentions in some of the structures that we set up. But some of the structures that we set up actually turn out to be tremendous barriers to us being able to deliver the kind of education that, that I think our young people deserve. Yeah, I think that we set up a mindset. Um, I, heard, I understand that Judge Manning was here yesterday, mm -hmm. and uh, I know he talks about a sound basic education, and Leandro, that's the language that's utilized. And somehow or another, that seems to be um, almost not high enough. But that's, that's, that's how we sort of set up public education. We want to provide a sound basic education. Just think about those words for a moment and understand that what we've done is we've established a limitation right from the outset. As opposed to saying that we ought to give our young people the very best education this world has ever seen. And then sort of march to that beat. Then you start to, I think, design systems and you start to equip people with the abilities uh, to do uh, great things. So I think that's a tremendous obstacle. I think that um, another significant obstacle is uh, the resources that we provide for public education. You know, uh, resources, and I'm talking financial resources at the moment, are certainly not everything, but it is critical that we provide the resources to public education. And for whatever reason, um, we've decided as a community, as a state, that we're going to limit ourselves pretty substantially on the resources that we provide. Well, the result then is that we get what we pay for, and maybe even a little bit less. As opposed to saying, let's resource ourselves in a, in a manner that will allow us to really sort of transform our uh, educational system. Um, so that, that is a significant concern and a significant obstacle as well. Um, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to throw this one out to uh, Eric and Esther. Uh, I'd like to, you to respond to a quote from Grant Wiggins. Quote, in a modern, unpredictable, and pluralistic world, it makes no sense to demand that every 18-year-old pass the same collection of traditional courses to graduate. Setting standards in the way that we do, mandating requirements for all by looking at our own generation's academic experience, rather than forward to the developmental needs of all students, impedes progress rather than advancing it. Then we add insult to injury, a one-size-fits-all diploma." End quote. Esther and Eric, what do you think are the most significant restrainers to moving away from a one-size-fits-all diploma? Well, first, um, change is indeed a process. And in order to change, you have to create a need for change. And so we have to let those people in power that sit around the table that make decisions understand that our 20th century system of education and ideas and beliefs are not aligning with 21st century skill sets. And once we can show that there is a need for change, we also have to think of the economic impact that this change could cause. It's easy, um, in education we think about measuring student outcomes. Everything has to be measured with some um, parameter for success. With a, with, um, if we remove that one size fit all diploma, there's going to be an economic impact on the restructuring and reorganization of schools which could greatly affect um, our, our system of education. And are we willing to provide an education for everyone that's going to be individualized based on their needs and outcomes? That's what I think is keeping us in the same mindset that we're, in that, that we're currently in. I, I would agree with that. Uh, one size does not fit all. And I think, if, if I can step out of the limb and say this, I think everybody sitting in this room 
um, is not a part of a traditional high school. And so doing things traditional ways does not benefit our students. Uh, we have some unique students, and not to say that uh, traditional high schools don't have unique students, they do. But we have the flexibility and the ability to do some, some, th some things tremendously outside of the box to reach mm -hmm. our young people. And I think we should embrace that um, to make sure that we actually reach them and do what's necessary for them. Um, my dad's 84, he was a principal way back when. And we have this conversation and he said, oh, if I was a principal now, I'd bring my paddle and I'd do such and such. And I, I said, dad, no, you wouldn't. You'd either be shot. <laughs> but I say that to say that he stuck. And what he did back then during his time was okay. That worked back then. But we have a new child coming to us now with new needs mm -hmm. that we have to help meet um, if we're truly trying to reach that, that whole child. And so I think being flexible enough and being innovative and having vision enough to see past um, the hard exterior that comes to us and realize that, that that's a talented individual, um, until we can get to that point, I think we will see hindrances continually in our schools. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. I'm going to throw this last one out for the last few minutes uh, to Mo, uh, if you could respond. In College and Career Ready, the book that we've been reading this summer, David Conley suggests, quote, the new American high school will be a dramatically different place that connects much more closely with post-secondary education, a place where essentially all students are taking the necessary steps to be college and career ready, end quote. While we've got examples of schools across the state that have taken on that mission, Mo, what will you think it will take to bring that vision to scale? I'd say uh, a number of things. First of all, we've got to establish what our vision actually is. Um, and um, that, takes some, that takes some time to really do and develop. Um, you know, in Guilford County, we you know, decided to establish a vision that really is about excellence. It's really about exploring many, many different avenues for our uh, students to be successful. I had the wonderful opportunity to walk into a district that was already doing some tremendous things, um, that had already uh, decided that in many ways, I like to tell folks that uh, we talk about charter schools. We are already, a, we're like a charter district in Guilford County in many ways because we are about trying to do and explore so many different things. And so, so sort of building on that as a vision. So establish that as the first thing is what is your vision um, for, for uh, educating students? Secondly, I think it's going to be important that um, we bring all uh, stakeholders uh, uh, into understanding and then supporting that vision. Uh, that uh, educators, um, you know, we cannot do it alone. Um, that it is going to require uh, many, many different uh, entities and individuals to come along for this ride and uh, lend financial and other resources uh, to help us uh, achieve this, this, the vision that we want. And I think when you ask people to come along, it turns out that they will come along and actually will do more than you can ever imagine. Um, as an example, um, we are in tough economic times. We said we wanted to start yet another middle college this year. And we're using resources from race to the top. And our Board of Education was concerned about, is that sufficient? It was our business community that said, we have seen how successful your programs are. Let's find a way to raise significant dollars to start this program. Let's go to our major hospitals and have them say, let us lend a hand in making this school a successful school. And so we're able to start our, uh, now eighth early middle college uh, in Guilford County this, this coming year. And um, tremendous external support to come along with what the educators are doing. The last thing I will say, and you'll, you'll say, well, maybe this is exactly the opposite of what I've just said. In order to really make the vision a reality, this, whether it's locally or at the state level, we have got to make that the standard course of business. And so we have got to say, no, uh, as important as it is to get the business community to lend financial and other resources, it has got to become part of what is the essence of how we do things in our state. So we've got to be willing to fund these programs across the state. 
I don't know how many of the schools, if we got a right show of hands, how many of the schools got started really with external support, as opposed to really saying, let's make it an internal investment 100%. And so we are at a place now, I think, in North Carolina where it's got to become part of how we actually do business. That what is innovative, and we need to continue to push forward on what that innovation is, but what we're doing now should be, we shouldn't have to go and get external resources for them. It should be part of what we actually do as, as part of our business. The last thing I'll say uh, on that is this. We have got to be persistent. Um, there, our young people are depending on us. And so um, in order for that vision to be, to t be taken to scale, we've got to be persistent. We cannot give up just because one or two people or multiple people say, uh, this isn't the vision, this isn't the way we should go. We get uh, bogged down with the realities of you know, board meetings or the realities of lack of resources. We have got to be persistent that this indeed will transform um, our educational system. We've got to be persistent in being sure that that happens. Pretty powerful 20 minutes from this panel. What do you think? <laughs>